Hi, my name is Ryan. I work at Mozilla on the SpireMonkey WebAssembly engine. Today, I'm going to talk about SpireMonkey's uh, compilation pipeline for WebAssembly modules. Um, I want to kind of start off taking a high level look at how this all fits together and what our the goals are and how we try and solve it. And then I want to kind of talk about some of the interesting corner cases and things that we've learned over time with it. This is not going to be a talk about how code generation works for functions and and all that, as there are plenty of other good resources for that. And I really just want to focus on the glue that goes around it and, and makes it work and all the different things that we've learned about that over time. So just starting off, um, we're going to talk about what is what does it mean to compile a WebAssembly module. Roughly, the problem is you know, input, we have module bytecode defined by the spec, and our output needs to be a loaded and linked machine code, which is what people normally think of. It's just ready to execute. But equally important, we have a lot of metadata about that machine code that we also create and accumulate. This is things like stack maps, exception tables, um, along with some linking information as well. And that is uh, equally as important as the machine code. And then also another thing that um, is the metadata about the module. This is where we have all the kind of information about the runtime structures we'll have to create when we instantiate this module. Uh, this is things like linear memory information along with tables, globals, element segments, data segments, and, and all that. So these three things together is roughly what comes together to represent a WebAssembly module. Now. Our goal with this is two things. We really want to minimize the latency of compile time. We also want to maximize the quality of the compiled code. Now, these two goals are in tension, and they are one of those things where you can trade off one for the other. So our, like many things in life, the solution to problems like this is to add another compiler. So uh, in SpiderMonkey, we have roughly two compilers, three if you count crane lift, but that's kind of an experimental thing that's not used in production. Uh, the first is that we have uh, what we call baseline. Baseline is a WebAssembly function compiler that's geared heavily to latency. It generates OK code, but very, very quickly. It um, operates over just a single pass over the WebAssembly bytecode, uh, just spewing out machine code as it goes. Uh, there's some interesting resources for that. Um, out there, if you, for example, if you Google the WebAssembly hacks blog post on the baseline compiler, that's a good high level overview of it. Um, in addition to baseline, we also have the ion compiler, which are, it's a compiler based off our ion backend. This is optimized for quality of the compiled code, and it's more of a traditional compiler architecture where you have an IR, you do um, uh, passes over it, doing optimizations, you do lowering to instructions, you do register allocation, all of that stuff. Now, the trick is you have these two different compilers and you do what is known as tiering, where you compile with baseline first to get quick startup, get that code running very quickly. And then in the background, you do a longer ion compile. And then once that is ready, you swap it that in and swap in the optimized code, replacing the baseline code. Um, this is actually really nice, and it's one of the main ways that we are able to achieve both of our goals and make a big difference in compiling WebAssembly modules. It's not the only one, but it's one of the main ways. And it's one of those examples where you're almost able to uh, have your cake and eat it too. But as you'll see, there are trade-offs involved, and it does have some complexity. So with all that being said, this is the high level of what we're trying to achieve. So let's actually get into um, the actual process of compiling the module. So first up, we have to run through just like the preliminaries of like selecting a strategy. What compiler are we gonna use? Are we gonna tier? And there's a lot of things that go into this decision, mostly collected from the environment of the VM. So the first is that uh, we don't always have every compiler available. Um, for a while, we didn't have ARM64 support for our optimizing tier. And uh, this is changing. We're now shipping this, but um, not all platforms are guaranteed to have compiler support for every compiler. 
And then we don't always implement every new proposal across all compilers. For example, the garbage collection proposal is only available on our baseline compiler. So in the browser, if you have certain experimental features enabled, that may disable compilers. And then in addition, if you have dev tools open and you're trying to do debugging on WebAssembly code with breakpoints and such, um, that's only supported by our baseline tier. And so that will also disable our optimizing tier as well. In addition to like the different things that go into picking a compiler, uh, tiering is not always available either. Um, if we aren't able to actually compile in the background, for example, if like we don't have a certain amount of parallelism on the system, uh, it doesn't really make sense to do tiering at all. And so we'll just jump right to the optimized tier. And in addition, in addition this one's a little bit more uh, tricky. Tiering is not always beneficial. Um, there's two main kind of cases here. The first is, is entirely 32-bit architecture specific, where we actually can be limited in the amount of executable memory we have. But we need to estimate, do we have enough executable memory to contain two copies of this compiled module? Because if not, then we should avoid tiering. Otherwise, we're at risk of an oom. Um. Now, in addition to that, we also want to be compiling a module that's large enough to actually justify the overhead of tiering. Because um, otherwise, if it's small enough, we might as well just run it through the optimizing tier and avoid the hassle. So now both of those things, we don't really know up front, so we have to rely on heuristics. And the heuristics are primarily based off the size of the code section. And uh, just to run you through a couple examples, um, they're just like constants taken out of our code. They're a little bit old now and may need some uh, refreshing and another look, but they've worked fairly well up until this point. So for example, if I want to estimate how many machine code bytes on uh, x64 I could expect, um, take the amount of bytes in the code section and multiply it by 2.45, and uh, there's your answer. If you wanted to uh, estimate how long ION would take to compile in milliseconds, you take the code bytes and divide it by 2100. And our current cutoff is if we expect ION to take uh, longer than 10 milliseconds, then we'll do tiering. Otherwise, we will uh, just do it up front. And then we also adjust for available parallelism. We expect to get um, mostly linear speed up, but not entirely from each additional core that gets added because there is some uh, things that don't perfectly scale up. But we do get quite a bit. So once this is all good, we know which compiler we're going to use and whether we're uh, just compiling once or whether we're tiering and we'll expect to do another compile later. So with that, let's actually get into uh, decoding the module and compiling the functions. So tiering is one trick, streaming is another. So the basic idea with streaming is let's minimize the latency of compiling a, a module by actually compiling functions as they're downloading. And this is like fundamentally, we're exploiting parallelism between the network interface and CPU and memory by being able to compile at the same time that we're also downloading. So it's it's pretty nifty and WebAssembly was well designed and then it, this is actually enabled and it's, it's really not too difficult. Um, the major concept that's important to it is that we synchronously will decode and validate all the module sections before the code section. And we put this in a structure we refer to internally as the module environment. And, um, you know, so this contains all the things you know, such as like types, memories, globals, tables, and, and all of that. And uh, this is this contains all the information that we, we need in order to like validate function bodies. Now, as a little quick stop before we actually start compiling function bodies, um, there's a little nice little trick you can do, uh, again, using the uh, tiering heuristics. You can estimate the size of most of the buffers that we use, and we'll do a quick pre-sizing thing for it for like the code and along with other metadata things so that um, we don't actually end up doing a bunch of wasteful realics. Um, and that can gain a good speed up because that can get quite expensive. So at this point, we're actually ready to start compiling functions. And so again, using that streaming, we each as functions become available, we compile them. And after each function's been compiled, we have a little merge step 
which merges the compiled code into a final buffer that we accumulate. This has to do things that are kind of quasi-linking. We, we pay attention to relative jumps and we'll resolve them if they're available. And uh, we also will adjust a lot of metadata um, to where the function's actual final destination in the code buffer. So streaming is one thing, parallel, comp parallel compilation is the other. Um, and you know, it's a really simple concept, but functions don't depend on each other in like a validation way. You can compile functions in any order. And so you can compile them in parallel. And again, and to, I guess to more formally put it, it, it depends on having the module environment, environment be this shared immutable object that you can pass around between multiple threads. Now, one little performance tweak that we found to be quite useful is we'll actually batch function definitions into the actual fine-grained task that we schedule on threads. And this is useful. Well, just I should also clarify, um, the compilation unit that we're compiling is still the function. It's just like a scheduling uh, concern. And the reason for this is it smooths over the overhead of scheduling a task because there can be many tiny functions in a module. Um, modules have a way of having many small functions and a couple of really big ones too. So um, we uh, were able to see some pretty good speed ups by implementing this. And now, of course, the optimal batch size is another heuristic. Um, there are quite a few of these. And just to give a, a rough example, we'll batch about 10,000 bytecodes for baseline and around 1,000 for ION. And that reflects the difference in speed of these uh, compilers. A little trivia item is with parallel compilation is um, without parallel compilation, the, the source order of functions will match the order actually in memory. But with parallel compilation, that's no longer the case. And um, the code does have to like handle that, but uh, it's not much, it's pretty easy. So now that we've actually compiled the function, there's a couple tasks that we need to do to wrap things up and uh, complete the module that we have. So the one of the most important ones is we generate what we call stubs, which are essentially just wrapper functions. And these are useful for interoperating with JavaScript. And essentially what they do at a level, at a low level is they handle the conversion between ABI and value representations between the WASM and the JS worlds. Um, and the JS has multiple worlds because it has an interpreter and a JIT. Um, so yeah, that, that's what it is. It, it handles the conversion between all of those things. This is where you see value coercions. So if you have like a JavaScript number and you're calling a WebAssembly function, this is where it gets converted to like an I32, for example. Now there are two big categories of stubs. We have entry stubs for entering into the module. And then we have, uh, and it allows calling a function from the JS interpreter or the JIT. And we have access stubs from WebAssembly to call out to an imported function that happens to be a JavaScript function. Now, stubs are important and there's some interesting optimizations we pull here um, that I'm gonna talk about in a later slide. But moving on, the next big step is to actually load and link the code. So this is where we actually ex allocate memory that can be made executable. And then we'll copy all of our generated code that we have so far into it. Um, we do some traditional linking things such as patching, patching absolute addresses now that we know where the final destination is. And uh, in addition, sometimes code can reference things like VM functions. And now at this point, we actually have the address uh, of that already, we can patch that in. And then we write protect it and then enable execution on it. So at this point, we actually have a complete module ready to go. And one interesting thing I really want to call out here is with our uh, function compilers and our stubs and just anything that generates code, we try very hard and we, we don't, we, we don't bake in the anything instance specific or thread specific in them. And so this module code that we've just generated is shareable across instances and threads. So when we actually instantiate a module, we don't take that module code and specialize it for like the specific linear memory object that we're using or anything like that. Um, whenever mo module code needs to access any anything for that instance it's on, 
it does it through an indirection to an instance context pointer. And this is a bit of a trade-off, but we found it to be quite quite worth it. Um, so now the next thing is we've compiled this module and that may be instantiated and someone may go running off with it and using their new WebAssembly code. Now, if we've just compiled baseline and we are also tiering, we need to actually start and launch a background task to compile the optimized code now. And once that's completed, we need to start the process of tiering up. So essentially what we're trying to solve here is someone may have taken this module and they may have instantiated it and they may be running this baseline code. How do we switch them over to this new fancy optimized code we've generated? And there's two tricky problems here. The first, like I said before, this baseline code we generate, it may have been sent to a different thread and may be running over there. On this different thread, it may actually be currently executing, maybe multiple call frames deep. So we have to kind of handle this, and it's tricky. It's one of those cases where you have concurrency and mutation. And so uh, those two things are not, not friends. So the way we try and solve this is we use a new data structure that we call it's not a new data structure, but it's a, it's a data structure we call a uh, jump table. And it's just essentially a bunch of entries that are indexed by function definition. And every baseline function prologue loads from the jump table and will jump to the address that's provided in the jump table. Now, normally this is just a very expensive no-op um, when optimized code hasn't arrived yet because that jump table entry will point to the next instruction inside that baseline function. But when we're ready to tear up and that task arrives with that new code, that jump table is patched and it patches to jump from that beginning of the baseline function into the body of the optimized codes function. Now, one of the interesting things is because that jump from that jump table in the baseline to the optimized code happens after a bit of the prologue has set up the frame, um, they do have to have some compatible code for uh, beginning to set up their stack frame. And in addition, another in interesting point here is that we can't patch the whole jump table in one atomic operation. And so there is a little bit of raciness involved, um, but it is, uh, as far as we know, safe. Now, there's a couple of pitfalls here with this approach to tearing up that give it some important limitations that are worth knowing about. The first is that we can only tear up at function boundaries. So this primarily is an issue with, if you had a baseline function and you were running it and you were in a long lived loop, when the tear up happens, you won't get that optimized code until you break out of that loop and recall the function. And so theoretically some code could be hitting this, but we have not been bitten too badly by it yet. And so um, the solution for this would be to implement something called OSR or on stack replacement, which would be uh, quite challenging. And so that's not something we're really eager to do until we really believe it was worth it. Um, the other pitfall is a little bit more subtle in that baseline function pointers are not universally revoked. The reason for this is when you instantiate code using this, these baseline codes or baseline functions, um, these function pointers get put into different places. For example, they may make their way into uh, funcref tables, uh, funcref table entries, and they can also be used in for imported functions. And so uh, these function pointers may persist and finding all the different places across the VM that they may have made their way into by the time ion fetch compiling is a bit of a challenge. And so currently we don't try and revoke it. And this is purely just a small performance hit because they have to deal with the fact that when they call it, that we will jump into optimized code, but we do have to go through the jump table, which is a bit of a, a bit of a pain. And kind of implied by that as well, um, another pitfall is that there's no freeing of the baseline executable memory because these baseline function pointers are not revoked and so we can't free the memory either. So um, 
that's again, this is something that hasn't bitten us too badly yet, but we are aware of it and we may try and solve at some point in the future. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we also have, you know, we have these things called stubs, which help us convert between JavaScript and WebAssembly worlds. Um, so we generate these entry stubs for calling into WebAssembly, and we do it for each exported function. And when I say exported function, it means any WebAssembly function that could be accessible to JavaScript. So it could be through an export statement, but it may also be from being inside an exported table or an exported global. And so um, the there's just some subtlety there. And um, now the problem here is we generate these stubs, but for example, if we have a, a large funk ref table, many of those will never be called. And so it's wasteful to generate all this JS glue code for it if JS is never gonna access it. And so the solution, a very a first cut at a solution here would be to only generate stubs for a function was actually grabbed from the exports object or from its table or from its global or wherever it conceptually lives. Um, Cause that's when we expect we might actually need it if JavaScript is actually trying to get at it. The problem with this is that there's some notable web content out there. Um, I will not name names that will uh, touch every or many exported functions, but it will never call them. And so that can trigger a pretty pathological case in, in generating these stubs lazily. Well, let's try it again. Solution number two, let's only generate stubs when a function is called. So this is getting better, but there is still one deficiency that's common to both of the solutions. And it's that generating stubs lazily means that we're gonna to have to do a little code generation, which means it's gonna to have to go into some executable page. And these stubs are not that large and they tend to not fill a whole executable page, which tends to lead a lot of wastage. And an executable memory can be valuable at times too, like such on such as on 32-bit architectures. And so um, we need some kind of a hybrid way of knowing which stubs are very likely to be called and doing those eagerly, and then which ones are not and dealing with the extra cost of them getting their own page if if for some reason we're wrong. So that leads us to a tweak. Um, we generate some stubs eagerly and following a heuristic and the rest we do lazily with the solution two approaches when they're actually called. Now the heuristic, um, the heuristic is roughly that any exported function or any function that's actually explicitly exported through an export statement will get an eager uh, stub generated. Whereas if you're just in a table or a global, we assume it's not likely that JavaScript is actually gonna call you. Now, someone may ask, so you've talked about tiering, talked about lazy stubs. What if we combine those together? How does that work? Um, and answer is that it's complicated. Um, and the problem is that each tier of code gets its own set of stubs because the stubs have code pointers hard coded into them for, you know, if you're exporting a function you want to, that you can call, you need to actually call that WebAssembly function. And so the problem happens when a tier up is happening and a lazy stub is being generated and they're both happening concurrently on multiple threads. The question is which, you know, which tier is a lazy stub gonna be generated for? And there are some nasty race conditions that can happen here. And they can also lead to unsafe conditions if they're not handled correctly. So we, are, we try to be very careful and we actually make this a synchronization point. And we observe a kind of a locking protocol so that when you're generating lazy stubs or you're tearing up, we just try and avoid this race. Um, and I don't want to get into the details more than that because there's um, it's not that interesting and we don't have the time. So lazy stubs is a pretty important optimization and it's also a bit tricky and, and not like not something you would necessarily expect. 
but to, to make the JS API work well, um, it's an important optimization. Now, with all those out of the way, let's talk about something that's more of a, a future improvement that we're um, not completely implemented at this point, and that is code caching. And this is the answer to the question of why repeat all this work on a page reload if we've already compiled this module before? The answer to this question is, well, let's not, because we don't need to. And the reason behind this is just that um, modules don't have a lot of context to them. They're very self-contained. So when you compile them, if you do it right with how you generate the code, it, they're very cacheable. And we've tried to keep that property uh, as well as we can. So what does this roughly look like? Um, the first step is you have to serialize the code in metadata, which is pretty straightforward. And we actually have all of that implemented, but we need a place to put it too. And so Gecko has this concept called the alt data cache, which is where optimized representations of network resources are. And if you use a resp response object from the fetch API, which is associated with a network resource, um, and you use that to compile, WebAssembly can kind of hook into that cache entry and serialize our code and our metadata into it. Then when you do a reload and you try and recompile using again, a response object from a fetch from a network resource, we can access that cache entry and deserialize from our previous comp compilation. This is really nice because it allows us to avoid baseline and tearing up and, and all of that and jump straight to optimize code without actually having to compile. So it's pretty nifty, um, but as hinted, this is not completely implemented yet, and there's some work to do due to some missing pieces in Gecko. So uh, we hope to finish this soon, but uh, it is something that we're looking to in the future. So in summary, there's just a couple of quick takeaways I wanna go through. Uh, first is that tiering is really cool, and it's one of those things where we really can make progress on two kind of conflicting goals. And why it's important is that uh, the speed of baseline really allows us to compete with JavaScript in terms of startup time. And that's really important on the web. And we just, we really don't want anyone to worry about including WebAssembly in their web app. We want it to scale really nicely. And then another takeaway is that easy streaming and parallelism are enabled due to WebAssembly's design. And that's not a universal experience across other languages and bytecodes. And it's something that we should really try and keep uh, to be the case. I, I think everyone does, but it is just, it's a very useful thing. And the last kind of small thing, as I've hinted throughout this presentation, is that there's a lot of heuristics and performance tuning that are, uh, even if you have good design, are still important and can get you multiples improvement. And so uh, it's good to pay attention to the little details. So uh, that's it. That's all I have. I hope you found something interesting in that um, and uh, hope you all have a great day.